Thank you all who are watching uh, this session. This is Creative Conversations for a Changing World. Uh, I'm Youngmoo Kim. I'm a technologist, a musician, a professor, and I direct the Excite Center at Drexel University, which is our Institute for Expressive and Creative Technologies. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first of our three conversations for a changing world. Uh, this is our new series on how the arts and education are innovating through the COVID pandemic. We wanted to start really big. So uh, today's event is of course, part of the BPHL Innovation Fest. And we have an all-star lineup of panelists that you'll meet in just a moment. Uh, and we'll tell you more about our upcoming events in the series at the end of today's session. And you can also find out more at our website, drexel.edu slash excite. Now, like many of you, I'm sure over the last six months, we have seen so many people and organizations make radical shifts in the way in which they can provide creative programming and services to their constituents. Um, the level of creativity that certainly that I've witnessed, and I think we've all witnessed, and out of the box thinking uh, has been phenomenal, uh, really. And it prompted us to think about what is exactly inspiring that? What is inspiring art? What is, uh, what is inspiring how people create and how, even how people are consuming uh, that production? So with that, that's sort of the context for these conversations. Um, let me first let me introduce our co-moderator for this series. And really, she deserves all the credit for this series because it was her idea uh, to create this series. Uh, she is an amazing clarinetist and musical educator and also the program director of Play on Philly, Jessica Zweig. So let me hand it off to you, Jess. Thanks, Young Moo. Well, I'm really proud to be your partner in crime in moderating this um, series. And um, it's really a pleasure to be speaking to three uh, creative minds in our city today. So today's conversation, like Young Moo said, is the first in a series of three. And when Young Moo and I started talking about this, we were just thinking about the creative things that we were doing in our own lives, in our own organizations. And we thought, how cool would it be to talk with some other people, some other organizations that are thinking big, that are thinking outside of the box of uh, rather than taking, uh, taking what we do in person and putting it online, what are they doing to completely rethink the way they're bringing arts and community to the public um, and to the people who we serve? So just a little bit about Play on Philly. Um, I'm the program director at Play on Philly. We are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year, which is really exciting. And um, if you don't know us, we serve about 200, over 200 students every single year. Our students are playing instruments, every instrument in the orchestra. And um, we have programming five days a week, two hours a day. Our students are learning their music um, and their instruments as a way of creating pro-social skills, life skills, executive functioning skills. Um, so us going online uh, was quite a shift and we're excited to talk to other people about their shift. So uh, today's conversation is gonna specifically um, talk about the design process and also the implementation process um, for arts organizations and um, arts education programming and how they're shifting to the virtual space or maybe rethinking it entirely. So we have three really special people joining us for this conversation. And each of them and their organizations were really thoughtful about how they've transitioned themselves and their audiences online. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Young Moo uh, to help us introduce these people. Thanks, Jess. Um, also, just one more plug, please follow Play on Philly and also Excite Center. I think uh, you, if you're interested in this topic, you might find some interesting things through both of our organizations. So we truly have an all-star panel uh, today, and I'm so happy to be kicking off this series with these three friends of ours. Um, first, uh, she's an active vocal performer, keyboardist, and conductor, an amazing arts and nonprofit administrator and serial entrepreneur. And I did not know this, a certified financial planner <laughs> as well. Uh, she's an incredible advocate how the arts advance equity and social justice, particularly in underserved communities. She is the deputy director and chief experience officer of one of our treasured Philadelphia institutions, the Barnes Foundation. Please welcome Valerie Gay. Hey, everyone. <laughs> And Val, please take a few minutes to introduce yourself. Sure. So, well, I'm Val. You heard everything that the young Moose said. And um, I'm really grateful that I get to be a part of this panel and to have this conversation 
um, at the bars, I see at least one of my colleagues, um, our chief technologist, actually, Stephen Brady is on the line. I think this is the same. Steve, Steve, if it's you, please put, um, please let me know in the room chat. That'll be great um, because I may be asking you some questions. Um, so we, um, I'm really grateful to be at the Barnes. Yes, it is him. Yay. Hi, Steve. Um, <laughs> because I've, the Barnes is not only just a cultural gem, it is filled with amazing professionals, each who are, um, I would say, in their own rights in their own um, perspective areas. And so it's been really amazing and wonderful to work with people who not only care about what they do, they are not only um, just brilliant at what they do, they are creative um, in what they do and collaborative in what they do. And so I'm really excited um, that, you know, with all of the carnage, I should say, um, uh, that COVID has brought, what is also brought is um, opportunities for advancement and opportunities to seize um, um, new ways of doing things. And so certainly the Barnes has done that. So with the Barnes takeout, um, hashtag Barnes roll call, which is um, an, an Instagram series that we have. I'll talk a little bit more about all of these, but just to name them, um, Barnes Art Adventures through our education department. We have a social justice series that's starting. Um, we did some low tech things like um, storytelling, um, as well as um, putting activity sheets up on our website. So it was a way to pivot. And Steve Brady, who's like I said, is on the call is, I call him our Merlin because he, um, kind of forecasted things coming up and really um, kind of pull the institution forward. Um, and I do say pull, I was one of the last people holding onto the door frames going, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do teams. I don't want to do it. And thank goodness, um, Steve actually forced all of us to do that. And um, so when we shut down, for example, on March 13th, we started our door, opened our doors again um, internally, I think it was March 16th, um, we just picked up where we left off internally. So while our doors were shut, the work never stopped. Um, certainly for those of us in administrative roles and creative roles who um, were not forward facing folks, um, the work just kept going. So I can talk more about that later, but I'm just so grateful to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie. We're such big fans of yours and the Barnes. Uh, our next panelist has overseen the transformation of one of our city's premier arts organizations. Under his leadership, Opera Philadelphia has commissioned 14 new operas, launched an urban opera festival, a digital festival, and now a streaming channel. It's no wonder the New York Times has described the company as a hotbed of operatic innovation. Please welcome the general director of Opera Philadelphia, David Devan. David. Thanks so much, Young Mu. Um, glad to see um, you're on our publicity team. Um, <laughs> I'm actually uh, a little known fact, uh, Young Mu uh, was on our team. Um, he was our resident technologist and during his sabbatical, he lived with us. Um, and really a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today was really informed by Young Mu's attitude towards um, embedding um, technology and live performance um, and how we can connect and use it as a vehicle to connect in new and different ways. Um, as Young Moo also articulated, um, we have been pretty innovative before the world caused us to be more innovative. Um, and so um, with our practice of new work um, and our fall festival, Festival O, um, we did do a pivot. Um, as the general director and president, I thought our pivot was done and we'd be, um, you know, letting that grow and mature. Um, so wasn't really expecting the pivot um, that we are now in, um, but we have used it as an opportunity to seek, um, well, opportunity um, and to explore what the artistic opportunities are. Um, and in our space of opera, um, throw distance, safe throw distance for singers for droplet safety is 15 feet and 200 square foot. 200 square feet um, with a 15 foot um, uh, reach and wind instruments is 11 feet. 
Um, so we're kind of like in super spreader land. So um, for safety, we've really had to rethink that. Um, and so I, I'll go through that in more detail, um, but that's just, uh, that's just queuing it up. So thanks, um, it's really lovely to be here. Oh, thank you so much, David. Just such a privilege to have you join us for this conversation. Our third panelist has tremendous experience working in both industry and the nonprofit sector, including uh, stops at the Village of Arts and Humanities, Art Sanctuary, Philadelphia Jazz Project, and the Philadelphia Clef Club, as well as the only culture lab of Culture Trust. She is currently the administrator of the Bartol Foundation. Give it up for Melissa Tally Palmer. It's all yours, Melissa. Oh, I think you're, you're muted. On mute. You're on mute. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Young Mu. That <laughs> So here at Stockton Rush Bartol Foundation, we were fortunate to be able to continue all of our programming under such dire pressure and with all of the changes happening. Um, we definitely had a great opportunity to have collaborating teams come together and take our trauma-informed teaching, art, and practices and move them from, you know, in person to online within a week, because we were two weeks in. And within one week, we had to make that five week program go online. And uh, Mindy Early and Siobhan Norris were tremendous in making that happen. So, I mean, the collaborations are the key. I've heard people say a couple different things. One, I'm um, in addition to being an administrator at Bartol Foundation right now, Beth Feldman Brandt is fortunate enough to be on sabbatical and is not with us for that reason. Um, but I give kudos to her for entrusting me with this opportunity. Um, interim speaking, we started just this today, uh, our first workshop series for the fall semester which will go through the end of the year. And consequently, we've rehired all of the artists that we couldn't, ha couldn't have teach in the spring and had them teach in the fall. But although they were unable to teach in the spring, we still allowed them to be able to be paid. And one of the ways we were able to continue to support. Um, this transition for us also has allowed us to be able to um, support other organizations. So I support the fact that we're able to have this conversation today and am totally excited to share more information about resources and opportunity. Key is opportunity. Thanks. Melissa, Val, David, thank you so much for introducing yourselves and, um, you know, for our audience out there, if you didn't know these three individuals, um, you know a bit more about them and their organizations. I would love to talk a bit, um, for, for starters, about the design process that all of you and your organizations went through um, when thinking about this, this pivot, because I think um, I, I, I felt a little bit like Val, where I was like hanging on for dear life, and then it was like, okay, I got to put my hands down and just move forward. So, um, but actually, David, I'd love to start with you um, because you really transformed um, or, or are transforming this, the annual festival, oh, into an online experience through the Opera Philadelphia channel, which is this um, new thing. And I'd love for you to just, first of all, give us a little bit about what that is. And then also, what is this design process that you think about when, when conceiving of a project like this? Yeah, so the Philadelphia, the Opera Philadelphia channel um, will be available um, at the end of October. It'll be available on your largest screen you have in your house, so probably your TV. Um, it will, um, it'll function like Netflix. Um, we have software developers developing um, the app that will basically function like that. It'll be on Apple TV, Roku, um, Amazon Fire, Chromecast, um, everything but uh, Xbox. We did not pay the premium for Xbox. It doesn't fit with our demographic that well. Um, so, um, uh, and it's it, it will be each month, there will be a new original program developed and produced for the screen. Um, uh, 
each month, every month for the season through to April, May. Um, the only, we will do one stream of one archival opera and everything, uh, the La Traviata, um, uh, for some creative reasons I can go through in later, but um, it's basically original for TV. It's like, it's like I, we walked into the um, offices of HBO and gave them the keys to the opera company and said, what y'all gonna do with it? Um, and, and, and that's what you're going to experience. And what we're trying to do is not replicate what's on stage. We are trying to provide meaningful artistic moments, um, on, uh, on a screen and convert opera, which is usually done in large scale with large expressions to intimate and close up, um, expressions. Um, so we can see the artistry in a different way. Um, it'll be behind a paywall. It's $99 for the season. There will be on-demand um, portionings of it, and we're working through trial um, for audience expansion as well. And it's based on a, a beta test of the digital festival we did in the spring, which used archival footage, mostly of our contemporary work, so we could track um, behaviors. Um, and the, um, so that's what it is. And the design process, we started with research. That's what we always do. Um, we have the largest research practice in um, classical music in the country. Um, and so we started doing um, charrettes, fancy word alert. Um, charrette is a brainstorming um, mechanism, largely used in architecture that allows um, people from a lot of different backgrounds to, um, uh, you know, think about ideas. So instead of asking people to check little boxes about how afraid they are of COVID, um, uh, what we did was we convened an online consumer community um, and did um, charrettes um, and, and, and uh, got our, our audience members to brainstorm with us to try and find opportunities that would be meaningful for our art and meaningful for them. And it also um, allowed us to identify blind spots and warning areas. And I'm happy to go into those um, whenever you feel appropriate. Um, but it really started through this really advanced research um, phase. Um, uh, this is not being done in the arts. Um, the company that did it for us is doing this kind of research for Netflix, Facebook, uh, Google, and Disney. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's the overview of the design process and, and what it is. Um, yeah. And the graphics I, really cool. <laughs> I think that's really amazing because I, I think that oftentimes we think about arts for art's sake, which I think is very, very valid. And then often in the arts, we're asked to validate why we are doing something. And what you're doing is you're sort of giving a backbone to the decisions you're making, which, um, I, I really appreciate. Um, Val, let me let me ask you a question because in uh, your I mean your title it's baked in engagement and experience um, and during a time like this it feels sometimes like we're just consuming art rather than experiencing it um, we're seeing things on a stage we can't touch anything we can't see it up close necessarily so what does it mean for you um, to work at the Barnes, which is a visual art space? Um, what does it mean for your uh, audiences to experience art? Sure, so I, I should say two things. One, we are actually open again, and um, now is the best time ever, I think, for folks to actually experience the art in person, in that due to the COVID um, safety restrictions, we have very limited capacity, we have time tickets, and so it feels like you have the collection to yourself. And it's actually a very beautiful experience. But having said that, um, there is the other side of it, right? So the online experience, and, and we use that word all the time. Again, I'm gonna keep referring to Steve, um, he is my hero, um, because I think that we have been, and very much like um, David and Opera Philadelphia, really thinking, um, forwardly thinking about um, opportunities to engage audiences and to create um, a different um, audience or visitor experience, if you will. And so um, the this, I think there's, I think, I personally think there's a fine line between consumerism and experience. And I think it's um, to do with, has a lot to do with the, the form that's being presented or the work that's being presented and the people who um, are experiencing the work or consuming the work. So 
for example, um, it could be the same work, right? Um, but if it's not something that touches me, then I'm not going to have a good experience with it necessarily, um, but that I, um, I, I will be con a consumer. We look at very much like um, what Opera Philadelphia does, looks at, we look at all the time at our audience. We're looking at um, where, who are the people that we want to reach, who's missing, um, thinking about that, who is missing. And then also thinking, um, looking out in the world, and this is again, I'm calling on Steve, um, cause we talk often about how we look out in the world, not just in the arts and to David Devan's point, um, but more about who is doing it well, and how can we replicate that? And so when you're considering those things, that opens up a whole world for you to think about things differently. Maybe there are ways that you um, can explore art, if you will, um, that's very different. So for example, previous year, so 20, we're in 2020, uh, 2019, 2018, we initially pilot, piloted um, a, a program. It was actually prior to me coming on, but fortunately I sit on a foundation that actually funded it. And so who knew that I got to um, take over the program, but it's called the, the virtual uh, reality project. So we took actual visual uh, or virtual reality goggles to the free library, to rec centers, to senior citizen homes, and literally brought the collection to these folks. Primarily folks, 84% of those folks had never stepped a foot into our um, doors, through our doors before. And about 56% of those folks actually came to the barns having seen it in um, the through the goggles, the idea is not to have technology replicate um, the experience, if you will, because it's very difficult to do that, um, and no one really wants to do that. But to create and one, I dare say, um, manipulate and take advantage of the opportunity of technology to create perhaps a different experience with. Um, with the work. And so, you know, whether it was our Barnes takeout, we were very quickly out the gate with these very short, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, eight minute um, conversations around a particular work of art, of art that's hanging in our collection. We sent them out around noontime um, and, you know, kind of like a takeout menu, right? Like you want to get your little dose of your lunchtime art. And they were wildly successful. People said to us things like, I didn't realize how much I was missing it. Um, I've never been to you before, but now I want to come because I didn't even realize how much art could, could touch me. And so, and that was just really one human talking to another through a screen with a piece of artwork and talking about the art. And finally, I'll say, um, as we are thinking about um, these experiences, they don't always have to be really flashy. Again, technology in our case is not really meant to replicate, but really to make stronger connections. And like I said, um, we, we talk about those kinds of things a lot and really thinking about how we can go deep. And we have a very, very much like opera, like everyone here, we have a very broad audience that ranges from people with PhDs in art history who only want to see, you know, that Renoir close up to people who have never stepped foot into a museum and everything in between. And so how can we engage all of those folks? And not one thing is um, the panacea for all audiences. Val, I think um, something that resonates with me that you just talked about is sort of bringing the art um, the experience, the the consumption of art, whatever we want to call it, to your audiences, maybe taking it outside of the confines of this space. Um, David, you talked about how uh, you know what your audiences want by asking them, literally asking them. And Melissa, I, I want to bring you into the conversation um, because at Bartol, what you do a lot, a lot of it revolves around teaching artists, the people who are delivering art to others. And can you talk about the process of including your constituents, so your teaching artists, as a part of a design process to bring something online? Absolutely. Uh, our mission is to provide resources to teaching artists. So through free teaching artist workshops, 
uh, through trauma-informed teaching artist practices. We just had the opportunity to design a program for administrators that would include preparation and trauma-informed practices for administrators who support, who most teaching artists work with and for. So we've done 60, we've done four sessions for teaching artists and then one for administrators. In November, we will facilitate uh, with funding from the William Penn Foundation, our six trauma-informed teaching artist practice cohort. And what this has done is helped us to design programs that will increase the impact. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is how do we prepare teaching artists to receive young people coming back into the education environment after having been through so much change. Um, and one of the ways we know to do that is to prepare teaching artists with resources that will support them in creating lesson plans and creating self-care. One of the things we transitioned into immediately after COVID and we had to cancel our in-house workshops, we decided that we would bring on a teaching artist who would do a series of five workshops that were all about self-care and open them up to the community and give people a platform in which to gain resources, create new connections, find out where opportunities exist for them to continue to create their art and get funding for some of their basic needs. Like, um, you know, people have not been able to get monies to pay their rent. People have lost income in such a way that they don't know what their situation is going to look like this, this fall. And so how do we, as an organization, support that? We continue to pay our artists in spite of the fact that they may not have been able to teach. And then we reschedule them and we pay them again. Um, so yeah, the designs around collaborations have been great. Um, through the trauma-informed teaching artist practice and the collaboration with Philadelphia Foundation, William Penn Foundation, and some others, we've been able to figure out how to greater serve more teaching artists and more community artists uh, through our grant funding. So yeah, we'll talk more about that. The, the theme I'm sensing is ask questions, ask, 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 ask the people who, who you're serving. And I would be remiss without um, asking my co-moderator here, Young Moo, to talk a bit about what he what he does, because um, the, the, pro, the STEAM integrated programs that you do K to 12 during the summer obviously had to drastically change. Um, that you couldn't have um, all these kiddos in your lab. Um, so what were you thinking about when you were redesigning your program and um, for a virtual experience? Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. Well, just like all the other organizations here, I mean, I think we went through a sort of a deep reflection process. Uh, so first I started, actually, I, I wanted to write more about what other people were doing. And so I started a, a weekly newsletter, just kind of on a whim, just because I thought, oh, those are cool things that are happening, you know, not just in Philly. I was focusing on Philly, but around the country, you know, these these wonderful musical collaborations that are ha coming, people coming together from across the world to do short pieces, dance performances, that sort of thing. Um, but as I started, so I wrote, I started that weekly newsletter. It's called Creating at a Distance, and uh, it's still going. So <laughs> feel free to to check it out and subscribe. Um, but as I was seeing more and these more and more of these things, uh, incorporating some of those ideas into our, our, our summer programming. Normally we do a six week middle school camp called Young Dragons. It's six weeks of steam, hands-on, all in person. Uh, you know, it's wonderful. We've served, you know, uh, hundreds of kids over the past few years and, and you know, an average of 75 per summer. Um, and that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> that was just absolutely not gonna happen in person. So we, of course, started to think about, well, what can we do uh, to put content, to do things virtually, to put content online. And I think that's when we discovered starting with stuff is, is both a blessing and a curse. 
when you start with stuff, when you have existing programs, um, you think about in transitioning to trying to make online content, you think about all the things you can't do, right? You, you end up fixating on the constraints. Um, so after thinking about it for a few weeks of, well, we have these programs, how could we deliver any aspect of the online? We said, okay, this isn't really going the way we want. We also had plans to create new activities for the summer. And so what we said, okay, well, with those, we're starting with a clean slate. So let's start with those and just reimagine, okay, yes, yeah, they're all virtual. Uh, and that was a lot more freeing, right? Just to say that, um, you know, that it's much easier to to take risks and to try things when when you're starting something new. Uh, we uh, I, I absolutely echo Val's point. Uh, you can't try to replicate uh, an, an in person experience online. That's that's just the wrong way to go. Um, I will also certainly echo David's point that um, you know when you're producing for a different medium, it is different. There are different constraints, different assumptions. Right, you, a staged play is very, very different from a television show, right? A staged opera is going to be very, very different from an online opera presentation. So um, once we kind of were able to clear those cobwebs uh, from our thinking, uh, we were able to come up with three activities, uh, virtual activities for middle school kids. Uh, one focusing on climate change, one focusing on virtual music production, and then the third is more of a VR uh, intro to coding activity. So those are available online. Uh, we were happy to produce those. We, of course, wish we could do more, and we're continuing to explore doing more. Um, but th that was kind of our process. So let me throw it back to, well, let me ask you, Jess. I mean, because, you know, we, we all know it's easy to have ideas, and it's much, much harder to then turn them into reality to implement, right? So let, let me start with Jess and ask, you know, I know Play on Philly went through a, a, a similar process for uh, transitioning to virtual learning. Um, so what, what was that process like and how was it different from the way you might have thought about that previously in, for an in-person program? Well, I think like you just said, it is so easy to be like, well, we do this thing and how are we going to fit this thing into this virtual box? And instead you have to sort of break yourself of those shackles. And that's what we did. We, um, as an organization and as a community, we went through a design thinking process um, where we asked, we asked our constituents, we asked our teaching artists, we asked our staff, we asked our families, our students and our, our parents, what is the need? What are, what are you struggling with? What, you know, what's the problem with playing an instrument at home? Oh, well, you know, my little six-year-old, they can't tune their instrument. Well, that's a problem. They can't play if they can't tune their instrument. So we sort of went through a process of thinking about how do we teach our students all of the skills and concepts and content around music theory and around singing and around playing without having an instrument in your hand. And we came up with several programs. We've, we're now fortunate that coming into this fall, we're going into our third iteration of programming. We did a program that we affectionately called Pop Out of the Box. And um, we had our summer program and now we're going into fall. And, and for us, it's all about this constantly iterative process. What worked, what didn't work, what is the need? Stop doing what people don't want. What do people want? What do people need? And let's do that instead. So that was that was our design process. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 amazing what happens when. Well, one, you just tr start to try things, and two, you get to iterate on those things, right? Because no, none of us, no one gets it right the first time, right? And so I think that having the ability to experiment is key. So let me ask David then, I mean, you, you went through the sort of the, the research and the prototyping process with the Digital Festival O. What, how has that met your expectations in pursuing the Opera Philadelphia channel? What have been some, what have been some differences, surprises? Tell, tell us more about that story. Yeah, so the Digital Festival, oh, like I said, was archival, really cool, really good archival stuff stream, but we found out that people are hitting the fatigue point on that. Um, and looking at st stuff on stage was remembering people what they were reminding people what they were missing, not what they have um, available to them. And so we had to flip that. So we did this re the the fancy research, and so you know we said, oh, we need creative um, work of consequence and substance that is a no brainer, easy to stream, and will compete with Netflix. It's the, the Reader's Digest version. So um, so now let's go to implementing. So well, first up, 
we have a gathering limit of 25 people in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so we have to, and I've already told you about the crazy throw disc drop, droplet throw distance. So we had to abandon stage first and foremost and move into sound studios because we needed space. Um, we also um, uh, needed to find projects or develop projects that had a certain scale of two singers, five musicians, because by the time you get the film crew and the COVID safety officer and the blah, 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 you know, there's only room for six artists in the room. So what do you do? Um, so we've had to work through that. Then we start talking to film people um, because, well, we're doing film. So, uh, and, you know, our whole industry is obsessed with capturing stuff on stage and then getting it online live right away. And so we talk to these film directors and they're like, well, what's the editing time? We're like, editing time? And they're like, yeah, I'm not taking the job unless I have three to four weeks of editing. Um, what? Um, so um, we had to completely change the distribution schedule um, and the shooting schedule to conform to how these artists do it. So again, listening, um, getting the right people, figuring out what to do. Um, and we started filming this week. So the other thing is, is we don't know. Um, uh, Frank Luzi, our um, brilliant um, VP of marketing said, well, we've jumped into the stream. Now we need to figure out how to swim. Um, and, you know, he's not wrong. So we're collecting, um, you know, really smart people that work in this area. Um, and we're gonna iterate um, and we're gonna learn and we're gonna give up our some of our authority. Which brings me to the last point is, if you're gonna create something new um, and um, you know there are very few benefits of pandemic life, but one of them is there are virtually no rules. So we had to be really careful that we don't bring all the crap from the heritage of opera it's exclusive Western white European experience, it's practice of exclusion. Um, and we need to bring that into this space. So, you know, I said, listen, I don't want us to bring any bad practice into this. Um, just let's start from scratch. And so um, we did work with arts equity specialists in terms of working and grafting to with our um, uh, artistic design team. Um, so all those three things, you know, um, safety, invite the right people to have skills, and invite people that you haven't given voice to in the past. And those are sort of, that's the, the soup that we're putting together to try and figure out how to pull this off. Wow. Um, and and we've, thank you for all those points. We're definitely going to circle back on some of those in just a moment. Uh, but that's that's sort of production at, at, at this point on a large scale. I kind of want to flip that on its head now. And uh, Melissa, you work with so many individual artists, individual artists, teaching artists. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the work that you've seen or some of the processes that have uh, start to be implemented over the past you know, few months that, that, that you find inspiring? Well, it's been really challenging. We funded 10 independent artists. Um, to the tune of $500 each and the opportunity for them to do what their work would have been is almost non-existent. And so with that being the case, we've given them the opportunity to use those resources to develop their curriculums um, in lieu of presenting they can create an independent work um, and have that be their project as opposed to what they were originally going to do. But what we've done is created a space for people to be able to design something new based on the scenario that they've been given. So we won't take that money back, but we'll give them a little more time. It's been really challenging. I can't begin to tell you how. Um, complicated it's been, um, especially for a lot of the individual artists. Um, we funded 23 organizations to the tune of uh, a minimum of $5,000 each. And again, um, those 
funds have been offered for general operating expenses, for the most part, to help people stay afloat. Um, and what they've been able to create um, online, many of them have been able to go online and several have been using those resources to, to figure out how to move forward in the next um, stage of their processes. Some of them are threatening that their doors may have to close. And so there we support, like I said, 23 this year, last year was 19 organizations. So, and we deal with many. Um, we service many in terms of providing resources as an as organization to do teaching artists work. And what we've been able to successfully give people through the trauma-informed teaching artist practice is resources, a platform, connections, and information that they can use to create successful lesson plans moving forward. And we've gotten a lot of feedback about the impact of how successful that work has been in um, supporting organizations. I know the Asian Arts Initiative, um, Gino Lee and I have been talking and they've been able to make their programming um, continue online. And so that's one of the success stories I can say firsthand. I've had that conversation. So yeah, it's challenging for everyone. And some of us are able to skate on ice and other of us, the ice is cracking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for that perspective because yeah, while we do focus on innovation, that's sort of the theme of this week. Um, you know, we, the, everyone is impacted by this in so many different ways. Right. And, and whether it's just trying to continue any kind of art making whatsoever, or just operational uh, continuance, or whether it's the chance to try uh, to break free of, of tradition and try new things. Um, Val, I mean, I think, you know, with the experiments uh, of, of the virtual, of the, the VR stuff, I mean, one of the, the most important things about the barns is the space. Right, it's the space itself. So, can you talk a little bit about uh, oh, reflecting on that implementation in virtual reality, and has that led you to think about the physical space any differently, or any any new kind of insights around that? Sure, sure. So, actually, during the pandemic, while everyone was still shut down in June, we actually activated our outdoor space. Um, we had the great pleasure to bring to um, to Philadelphia to the to the parkway um, a beautiful photo exhibition by a West Philadelphia uh, artist and, and photographer Kim McFarlane which featured um, at the exhibition was uh, photos of of black fathers and so it occurred on the weekend of the summer solstice Juneteenth and Father's Day um, and so it was amazing um, it took a day to to install um, and then two days for exhibition outdoors. And so basically three days of using the, the grounds in a way that we hadn't and bringing the museum, if you were, um, outdoors, as well as bringing the community to the museum and, and um, display in that way. It was one of those things that it was, we got a lot of the credit because we got to um, project these larger than life 30 something feet high by, I don't know, 20 feet wide photos. Um, but it was other um, arts organizations, everyone coming together and um, contributing. So Opera Philadelphia was a partner. Um, there were community groups that were partners, other arts organizations that were partners. And so this was an amazing thing. And it really got us to thinking, boy, what else could we do on our grounds? I should say we had already planned um, Again, I mentioned the brilliance of some of my colleagues. And so Kathleen Green, the curator of public programs had already been thinking about how can we activate our spaces outdoors so that we could still bring some of this life that one would have on the inside outdoors. Um, and then as David alluded to earlier, I stated earlier, you know, given the capacity constraints that we have both indoors as well as outdoors, that's changed some of the things that, that we are doing. However, um, I think as, you know, as this time goes on, 
We probably will see more external exhibitions, which could be really beautiful. Um, the building is just such an incredible building. It's also one of those buildings that people are like, what is that place? You know, I've seen people walk by, including when we were doing our VR um, project, we would go to the library across the street. We tell people and people are like, wait, that building across the street there? I always wonder what that was. Never knew what it was. There are no signs. So, you know, bringing people first outdoors and then indoors. And to your point, Young Moo, we have such a large campus that there are lots of things that we can do. So I'm looking forward to, you know, whether it's visual art or performance art or some other um, connection with our community that we can use the space in that way. I'm, I'm really looking forward to how we, that will play out even in the fall and winter months. Oh, that is so exciting. I have to tell you, I am not a native Philadelphian, although I do feel like I'm, I'm getting there. But um, the Barnes was one of the first places that I went that I felt like I, I'm going to become a subscriber. This is going to be this is going to be one of my homes. So I, I'm like not paying you lip service. I am telling you that that is how I feel about the Barnes. Um, I, I do want to invite our audience, um, you know, in the last 11 minutes, we're going to squeeze this for all it's worth because we have such um, a distinguished panel that we want to continue to talk to. I think we could do this for hours. Um, but if you have questions, please write them in the chat and we'll try to get to some of them. I can't promise all. Um, and while you're writing your questions in the chat, Val, I, I do want to come back to um, something that you mentioned earlier and, and also what you were just talking about, which is... Um, you know, bringing the collection outside onto the parkway or wherever it may be. And I think that we would be remiss in this conversation if we also didn't talk about how we implement um, programming in a socially just and equitable way. Um, David, I loved how just like very bluntly you uh, mentioned like just leaving the crap at the door and how are we thinking about moving forward um, and, and welcoming new audiences? So at the Barnes, you know, his Miss Dr. Barnes's uh, collection was, you know, a lot of Western art, and um, although he did have an eclectic collection, but. Um, what role does the Barnes play in expanding the voices um, that are being heard and the stories that are being told um, that maybe haven't necessarily been told? Sure. It, it all comes down to relationships as I see it, right? It's like people connecting to people, people connecting to art. And so um, it can't be lip service. So David um, knows this very, um, very well. Like, so I, I love Philadelphia. So Opera Philadelphia and Art Sanctuary, where I used to work and, and run the organization, we were very much um, married for for many years. <laughs> yes, um, and and it's what what I learned from that is really about relationship building. You can't, like David said, you can't just say here, here's this thing I made for you. Here you go. But you got to ask people what they want. Sometimes people don't necessarily know. They can't necessarily articulate exactly what they want in your language. So you have to figure that out. And it, again, goes with um, relationship building. So we have been deep in the community for years and most of our ticket buying audience don't know this work. So we have a strong relationship with Puentes de Salud in South Philly, for example, where we bring biliteracy and bilingual um, programming to preschoolers, we go to where they are, we deliver programming in Spanish and English with our teaching artists, then we bring the entire family back to the barns once a month. Um, we have programming in the collection, and then we bring the children downstairs for art making and their parents, and we're doing things like skill building uh, with them and using art as a centerpiece. We're also in West Philadelphia with the people, uh, the People's Emergency Center in Barnes West. Um, and that's actually how Kim McFarlane came to us through relationships. They would not have known to come to the barns if they hadn't seen us there for years already developing these relationships. So it's saying, you know, I, I am a classically trained, Europeanly classically trained opera singer, you know, art artist, but as a West Philadelphian black girl, I fell in love with this music. We know that art can stand for itself and can reach out to people, but we often we can't just expect that we say our doors are open and expect people to flock to us. I believe it is on the onus and it is the moral responsibility of the institution to go where the people are and then bring them in and create a relationship. Art is about relationships. Yeah. So 
For David, um, you want to talk about Opera Philadelphia because you guys are um, you are putting your money where your mouth is. Um, you know, with "We Shall Not Be Moved" and "Sky on Swings," and um, I don't want to give your whole pitch, so you get. Yeah, no, no, no. It's you know, it's interesting. And in, in, uh, back to making this digital, like "We Shall Not Be Moved," we produced it. It sold out. Um, at the Wilma Theater and our, and our first festival in 017. And then we sold it out at the Apollo and we sold it out um, in Amsterdam. Um, and for our opera digital stream, more people saw it in our digital stream than all three of those theaters combined. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, um, and that one was really important to make free because um, we just wanted as many people to see it um, as possible. So, yeah, I mean, I think also the way the, one of the things we need to do as institutions, and th this was a string in one of the chats here, is that um, bigger organizations um, need to really collaborate with people that don't look like them. Um, and I'm not, I'm talking beyond uh, race, certainly, um, and certainly in Philadelphia is an issue, but also the type of organization, right. the size of the organization. We've worked with the bearded ladies. We've worked with, uh, you know, artist collectives and fringe artists. And, um, and I think that um, there's an opportunity um, to just make sure that if we are trying to do something different, to collaborate with people that don't physically look like us, but people that don't actually produce like us and don't think like us, that's only going to make the idea stronger. The trick is you have to park your authority at the door. Um, Okay, so there we are starting to run out of time, uh, and there are some questions popping up here. So. Um, Rather than, um, you know, I'm just going to go to the Q&A and throw a couple of these out there because I want to make sure the audience gets. Uh, well, one, actually, David, you just kind of spoke to this. Uh, you know, why is it that there are some organizations, I'm going to remain, this, some shall remain nameless, uh, that don't seem to be adapting as well? larger organizations and why are there others who are trying new things, you know, in, innovating, for lack of a better word, more quickly? And, David, why don't you start and then? Yeah, I mean, it's else? it's hard with these big organizations, especially you know the more storied the brand, the harder it is to change, mm -hmm. um, and the stronger the history of the organization, um, uh, the harder it is to change. Um, and so, I think the biggest challenge is, um, you know, being comfortable with what you don't know, being vulnerable in that, and connecting and allowing people to connect you with it, and it just the bigger the organization, it's just the more effort that freedom takes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I um, agree with that. I was gonna say too quick when looking at the question, I think you have to develop a culture, a culture of curiosity and innovation. And certainly Apple Philadelphia has that. And it does start with leadership. And so if the leaders are open and curious and you have just even a a portion of your institution is dedicated to R&D, if you will, I think then one can be better situated to take advantage of opportunities that COVID has presented to us or any other opportunity. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I think you also hit it, hit the nail on the head with the, that word leadership. I mean, obviously we've heard a lot from David and, and we know of his visionary work at Opera Philadelphia. I'll also give a shout out to the leader of the Barnes, Tom Collins, mm -hmm. who, you know, I was, I am blown away by by what he's accomplished, what he's done. Also, to come in with the idea, this this crazy idea that an institution should reflect the city that it's situated in, right? right. I mean, crazy. I am no. both amazed and appla and applauding that, and also sort of dumbfounded that it took so long <laughs> for you know for organizations to get on board with uh, that kind of perspective. Hey, uh -huh. Young Mu, could I just riff on something there just about uh, leadership? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a leader. Thank you very much. But um, it's really not about, I mean, yes, we need to be leaders and yes, we need to create a space. Um, but, you know, just to everybody out there that's not that leader, um, speak up, make sure, um, push for these things. Mm -hmm. And the, the good leaders are going to listen. Right. Um, and the and the and the not good ones aren't. And you need to find another leader to work with. Um, but it just you know, I think that there's an opportunity for everybody to have agency and not wait for permission um, to do what they think you know the leaders want. And the hopefully, and this is a struggle as a leader. Do you know what I mean? That 
you may have a vision, but you have to be completely open for someone having a better one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, certainly. Well said. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, we had a question that I will answer, which is, you know, if you're not in the Philly area, how might you be able to keep up and, and engage with these things? Certainly. Uh, I think you can go to the, the separate organizations highlighted here. I mean, certainly the Opera Philadelphia channel is accessible everywhere. Uh, the Barnes online content is accessible from everywhere. Uh, I'm going to throw up, of course, this is my segue to point out that this is not our, our only conversation around these topics. Uh, we will actually be hosting two, Jessica and I will be hosting two more of these, including one in two weeks on September 29th, and then another one on October 13th, so every two weeks. Uh, and the one, two weeks from today, uh, we're gonna be focusing on collaboration. We have, again, another amazing panel. Jay Flewellen, amazing composer and teacher. Ellen Fishman, Director of Arts and New Media at, at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy, another amazing composer. And then also Paul Smith, uh, co-founder of Votus 8, the amazing singing group based in the UK and CEO of the Votus 8 Foundation. So you please do come back if you like these topics, uh, come back and uh, visit us. And then again, we'll have another one on October 13th as well. Um, okay, we uh, really are at the end here. So I just wanna throw it to um, uh, the panel and, and, and to Jess for some final thoughts. Uh, kind of what are things uh, that you've learned through the pandemic that um, you will carry forward past the pandemic. Hopefully hopefully there's a future for us, right? Hopefully there's a future post pandemic. What have you learned? What are practices, ideas, um, learnings that you're gonna carry forward? Well, my, I'm unmuted, so I'll just start. Um, I, I, I would say for me, I, and I think for the Barnes, we are carrying forward a, just a different way of looking at things. Um, I often say in the barns, like any problems, frankly, that we have uh, are first world problems and ergo probably just an obstacle and not an intrinsical issue or problem, right? Like it's a wall, it's not a wall, it's actually probably a little hurdle, like can, we can jump over it. And so I am no longer letting no, if you will, be the thing that stops me, but thinking like, huh, okay, this didn't work. How can I apply scientific and or artistic thinking to this issue um, to come up with a better solution as opposed to saying, oh, oh, well, I guess it's not for me or whatever, you know? And I think we are looking at the same way at the Barnes. We are not going back. Our online classes, I will say, um, have shown us, we thought previously that people would want, would not want to come to a class if they weren't in the galleries. That was part of our um, value proposition. And truly it is but we have more people in one month than we did all of last year. And so it is changing how we think about the world. Melissa, do you want to uh, share your thoughts? Yeah. Wow, Val, that's some interesting stats, girl. <laughs> I mean, I think going forward, I would piggyback off of what Val said. And in addition to that, the surveys to identify what your audience want and provide what it is they need, keeps them your audience and keep them sharing about what it is you offer that they can use to carry their work forward. And our connection with the individual artists as well as the nonprofit organizations and the funders is what make our foundation such a strong foundation at a time like this when all of the people in the room need to be having conversations on many different levels in order to find out where the strengths and weaknesses are and how we use those strengths and weaknesses to create new opportunity where there's obstacle. David, final word, very quick Our final, final word. words. I hope this all this work isn't a Band-Aid. Um, I hope um, that it's lasting. I hope we'll, our opera festival comes back. I hope we'll continue uh, Grand Opera in the Academy. And I hope the channel stays as a third form of expression. And all this work we're all doing is not a short-term Band-Aid. 
Thank you all. Thank you to our distinguished panel. Thank you, audience, for being here and participating in this conversation in the chat. Um, thank you, Young Lu, um, my colleague. And um, again, as Young Lu said, we're having a second conversation on September 29th, which is going to focus totally on collaboration. What does collaboration mean in this creative virtual world? Um, and I saw some questions in the chat about collaboration, so please tune in. And the third conversation um, on October 13th is going to be about how do we look to other sectors? How do we look to other nonprofit organizations and social services or technology um, to think about innovating in the artistic space, uh, which I think should be a really uh, interesting conversation for all of us to have. So thank you so much. And thank you to BPHL. Um, it's been such a pleasure uh, to host this conversation and to talk with these wonderful individuals. Have a great evening. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.